Houston, we have a podcast. You're listening to the Premier Rockets Podcast. It's H-Town Hoops, hosted by Brandon Scott and Adam Spolane. Yes, it is the H-Town Hoops Podcast. Brandon Scott here with Adam Spillane, Austin Mendez, handling things for us behind the scenes. And Adam, it looks like we've got a much better sense for what this Houston Rockets team is going to look like in the 2023-2024 season. At least a better sense than the last time that we talked. The big headline since the last time we talked and the big headline going forward right now is going to be the signing of Dylan Brooks, four years, 80 million uh, sign and trade deal, obviously, with the Memphis Grizzlies. That is going to send Josh Christopher to uh, to the Grizzlies. Uh, of course, you got a couple of other signings that were pretty important. Jock Landale and Jeff Green adding some depth at center. And so we're going to start here, though, with Dylan Brooks. I feel like this was the controversial one. This is the one that you and I have talked about on the podcast and in other places that we've been asked to appear. And look, we acknowledge that Dylan Brooks is a plus defender and has had some some positive moments and has contributed to winning in the NBA with the Memphis Grizzlies. But this was one where I don't know if you and I, you or I were a huge fan or proponent of the idea of Dylan Brooks coming in here, but we acknowledge that he was a target for Rafael Stone, M.A. Udoka, and the Houston Rockets. And that's one thing I'll say before I kick it over to you is that it was very clear the guys that they targeted. It was very clear what their wish list was, at least the top of it. And they went after it, and it looks like they got two out of the top three, I would say, in getting Fred Van Bleet and then signing or, or – going to sign Dylan Brooks. Obviously, they lose out on Brooke Lopez going back to the Milwaukee Bucks, which makes a, a lot more sense for him, a ton of more sense for him. You see why Fred Van Vliet would come here um, for the extra money. You see why Dylan Brooks would come here not being welcomed back where he came from. But Brooke Lopez certainly going back to a championship contender. But what is your reaction to this Dylan Brooks signing, man? Um. The money obviously is a lot, and I think that's the one – you know, none of us are surprised that it happened. Both of us, like you said, we weren't exactly in favor of it, and I still haven't changed my stance on that. I still would not have – that's not somebody that I would have looked to bring in, I think. But I don't know what the alternatives were, if they felt like there were any better alternatives. Um, And the contract, while on the surface, four years, 80, that's high. But the way that it's structured – and we don't know exactly how it's structured yet at this point – uh, but the fact that it's going to descend in value every year, I think that's important. I think that's a really important part of this contract where uh, you front load it and then um, the financial hit isn't nearly as much in the years moving forward, which um, means it takes up less of the cap uh, in the years to come, or it makes it a little bit easier to trade. So defensively, they improved a lot um, over the last couple of days, and that was important. They have been one of the, if not the worst defensive team in the league. Um, Brooks is a shooter. Uh, he's obviously, it hasn't been very good, but I, I think there are reasons to think that it could get better. Um, he's kind of taken a dip from three point range the last couple of years. And it's kind of gone up as he's attempted more shots. So maybe if he's not shooting nearly as much, he can get that up. And also he's, I, I think the number from the left corner, he's like 38%, but from the right corner, he's, below 20%. It's something like that. Like for, for whatever reason, from one corner, he's awful from the other corner. He's fine. So th- there are certain areas of the floor uh, from behind three point range where he's actually league average, but from the corners, that's where he just hasn't been nearly as good, at least from the one corner. So um, all in all, the roster is, is somewhat coming together. Uh, I, I think that when you look at it now, I, and this might be something that we'll get into in a minute, but um, your starters appear to be Van Vliet, Green, Brooks starting at the three uh, and then you have Jabari Smith Jr. And then one of the centers in all likelihood, it would be Chingun at this point, but you're seeing a rotation come together and it's obviously going to be very different from how they closed out last season. And when you look at the record and they went 22 and 60, it's probably a good thing that they're going to be considerably different moving forward. So I, I think all in all um, from a, a talent standpoint, they are better with Dylan Brooks Um the contract isn't as bad as maybe four years in 80 million would look, but it's still, it's not maybe the move that I would have made, but 
I don't know. Did they have any better options? You know, when you look at the landscape out there, was there any other move that they could make? And I guess this is probably, you know, getting Van Vliet and getting Brooks to go with them. I think that's probably the best that they could have hoped for. Yeah, Adam, the way I would describe it is like, like for me, I would say, you know, if you came to me and said, going into this free agency period, the Rockets have 60 plus million dollars in cap space. And the best players that they're going to get out of there, the best players, the top end here, are going to be Fred Van Bleet and Dylan Brooks. And they're going to pay them an absorbent amount of money. They're going to pay Fred Van Bleet over $40 million a year. And they're going to they're going to pay Dylan Brooks over $20 million a year. And you said, hey, that's what they're going to do with their cap space. Those are going to be the two best players that the Rockets are going to get out of free agency. How do you feel about that? I would have been underwhelmed. I would have been underwhelmed by that by that prospect, and I'm underwhelmed by it now. But even with that, as as underwhelming as it seems and as it feels to say that that's the best, the two best players that you're coming away with out of free agency, it's also hard not to acknowledge that this team is demonstrably better. It is a it is a better basketball team, and it, it's important, I, I think, at least to not get so caught up in, you know. How wild are you? How impressed are you by the guys that they signed as opposed to saying how much better did they get with what they had, with the opportunity that was in front of them? And we talked about this not being an ideal free agent class. There wasn't going to be a name really out there other than the one that was most controversial, maybe, or or the two that were most controversial in James Harden and Kyrie Irving. And that would have come with a lot of noise, both of them. But for the most part, this just wasn't a, a super talented free agent class. Meanwhile, the Rockets had a whole bunch of money to spend yeah. and, and, and very much needed to spend it, not just because they needed to spend it, but because they actually needed to get better. You know, they needed to spend the money. They needed to make their team better. Like So all these things had to come together. And so it's underwhelming overall when you think about paying this much money to those guys. But when you lay out that starting five that you just did, Fred Van Vliet, Jalen Green, Dylan Brooks, and then the young guys, two other young guys, and Jabari Smith Jr. and Alperin Shingun. It's not that bad. It's, and it's a better one than, than the one that you wrote out last year. And it's one that you can work with. I feel like a lot of the Rockets' improvement and the Rockets, I guess, how, how good they can be and how soon they can be that good, it depends a lot on Jalen Green's development. And it's not going to all be there in year three. You just want him to take a significant step from year two to year three. But that's clearly like the... The the player that a lot of fans want to get in free agency, I feel like is the player that the Rockets view Jalen Green as already. And so it's really kind of up to him to become that. But I, I wanted to I'm just going to point out here on on Dylan Brooks's three point shooting. And you mentioned those. Those are really odd numbers about shooting better in one corner and not the other. Uh, I don't know if that's like a sight issue or what's going on exactly there, but I mean, obviously it's the same distance, so it's just an odd thought. But maybe a right left thing, you know? He's yeah, right yeah, yeah, it could, yeah, it could be a sight, right left. Yeah, it, it could just be a comfort thing. But he was thirty-seven and a half percent from three in his second season in the NBA. That was 2018, 2019. It went down to thirty-five point eight, so from thirty-seven and a half percent to thirty-five point eight percent the next season. Then the season after that, actually the next three seasons after that, or since then, it's been 33%. Uh, cumulatively of the last, over the last three seasons. And then the last two postseasons, it's been 30.7%. So it's like, you're looking at it, you're like, man, this is going, because I can remember a time now, and it's reading these stats off, it's like, okay, I feel like I remember a time where Dylan Brooks actually did shoot the ball fairly well or like decently, or at least where I didn't view him as a negative shooter or a guy where I'm like, Hey, don't shoot the ball or don't shoot. And then that kind of developed over time. But over the last couple of years, the issue with Dylan Brooks, and this is kind of just my thing. It's just like the level of awareness, self-awareness, you know, like does he think more highly of himself than perhaps he should. And that's not, that's not to take a shot at the guy personally, other than just to say that, he was on a team where he wasn't the main guy, but it was a winning team where he felt like he was entitled to a certain number of shots and a certain kind of quality of shots that I wouldn't call high quality. And I'm really concerned about the idea of him going from a team like that that was competing 
that he was helping win, feeling like he had sort of this entitlement to certain shots to come to this team that's rebuilding that doesn't really have that many established players on it, aside from Fred Van Vliet, you know, and, and Jalen Green obviously is the future of the franchise, but, you know, he's a kid, third, third year player, still hasn't proven much. So I'm, I'm just a little bit worried about Brooks's overall influence on the team, even if I can acknowledge that he makes them better defensively. Uh, on the three point shooting, um, the 37 and a half points, the 37 and a half uh, percent that you mentioned, that was on 2.2 attempts. Now, what's encouraging about his three point shooting, though, is that next year um, he goes from 2.2 attempts per game to 5.6. And that first year with, at 5.6, he was at 35.8. I mean, you will gladly take 35.8 percent from three on almost six attempts like that's that's I think that is what they have to be hoping that they can get back to because um, that's that's a high that's a high number of shots per game and the percentage is fine. So if you can somehow get back to that and not the um, 30.9 and 32.6 of the last couple of years, then it's OK. The problem the problem with him, it's just the shot selection. It's not necessarily that he takes a lot of them. It, there's, there's a lot of listen. There's a lot of Marcus Smart. Uh, and you know, I think it's interesting that Ime Udoka coached Marcus Smart for all those years in Boston, and you get somebody who's very similar, just a little bit bigger in essence than Marcus Smart, uh, not not and not a point guard. Um, but it's just the shot selection of hey, I'm just gonna come down and fire this up with 18 left on the shot clock. That's the kind of shot that that hurts them. That's the kind of shot that they really need to avoid with him. And if he can avoid that shot and be a catch and shoot guy and hey you can get to the paint every now and then and maybe draw some fouls if you can have that to go with the defense then hey this is the signing's fine the signing works out um the problem is if he tries to do everything and you know you look at the playoff numbers um he let's see a, a last season he attempted 4.7 three pointers during the regular season in the playoffs that number went up to six and a half this season, he attempted six three-pointers in the regular season. Um, in the playoffs, that went up to seven. So his three-point shooting should not be, you know, his attempts, you don't want them going up in the playoffs compared to the regular season. That means he's trying to do too much of it. And that seven, um, that that comes in a uh, in a playoff series where he got ejected in one of the games. So that's how often he was shooting is that he attempted seven a game, and that, when, and that comes when he got ejected in one of those games. So – he just needs to, if he can rein it in a little bit and play within like the structure of the offense, then he has a chance to be really good. There's also one other troubling thing. I don't even know if troubling is the right word, but he's, you know, he's six, seven, like he's, he's, he's a good size player and that helps him defensively to where he can guard pretty much everyone, at least one through four, if not one through five, he doesn't rebound. And that was the one thing I'm just looking through the numbers and his rebounds per game, it's like three. You need a little bit more rebounding from that position, especially if you're going to be like six, seven. Like that was, you know, of all the things that Trevor Ariza did well, a lot of the things that kind of got overlooked with, with him was the rebounding. Like he would come in and sneak in and take some rebounds. And how do you finish a possession defensively? It's not just about holding a team to a bad shot or contesting a shot. You actually have to get the rebound. That's how you end the possession. And so they're going to need him to rebound a little bit more because you look at the guys that they have on the team. Alperin Shingun's not a real good defensive rebounder. Jabari Smith Jr. was, I think, better than I thought he would be, especially when you consider how slight he is. Um, so that's, that's a positive. But then the guards... I don't really consider Jalen Green to be much of a rebounder. Fred Van Vliet's a little small to be, you know, impactful as a defensive rebounder. So they're going to need Dylan Brooks to, like, get after it on the boards a little bit, a little, at least a little bit more than what he did in Memphis. Yeah, no, for sure. And also, I would just point, and maybe this is less important than what you're talking about, like, they just flat out need him to rebound because of the things that you mentioned about the rest of the personnel. But on Dylan Brooks specifically, just from a – from an on brand standpoint, a lot of people talk about how Dylan Brooks is going to bring an edge. You know, can I, can I interrupt you really quick? Go I'm ahead, sorry. I'm just, I'm looking at this right now. Um, Jalen Green, Fred Van Vliet, and Dylan Brooks, who averaged the fewest number of rebounds between the three? Jalen Green, Jalen Green, Dylan Brooks, and who? Fred Van Vliet. Who, who, who averaged the fewest rebounds of the three? I'm going to say that Fred Van Vliet averaged the most and that Dylan Brooks averaged the fewest. You are you are correct on both. Yeah, so it, it yeah. Is a, it, it's not great that your six seven wing 
rebounds at a lower rate than your six foot one point guard. So I, that's, yeah. that's one of the things that, that I'm going to be looking at as this thing moves forward. Uh, Dylan Brooks is going to have to rebound like that. That's just all there is to it. Well, and what I was saying is though, especially if what he's supposed to be bringing you is edge and toughness and all of that, like, Getting it, getting after it on the boards, I feel like is a part of that. Like anybody that's ever been classified or categorized as scrappy or edgy or like, you know, some level of badass or whatever was like more than likely a rebounder. And most defensive guys also get after it on the board. So that's also a little odd to me that that's two things about Dylan Brooks that are that are odd, but also probably fixable. Like there's nothing in his profile or his game that would suggest that he can't rebound or that he can't fix whatever issues he has with the corner three. So I, I will say that for him that I, I do feel like it's in there. They just got to they just got to figure it out. But overall, uh, you know, team gets better. Let me ask you this, though, before we get on over to some next topics on, on Dylan Brooks what it does with the starting line. Another another reason why I didn't necessarily need Dylan Brooks was because, you know, or didn't feel like the Rockets needed Dylan Brooks. And again, we just acknowledged that he makes them better defensively. But it was because I thought that they had pretty good wings. I thought they had wings that they could work with, even if, you know, you can acknowledge that Dylan Brooks brings something that maybe those guys don't bring. But the two signings now, we talked about Fred Van Vliet, the previous episode, we talked about what that does with KPJ, how that moves him off the ball. But now what this certainly does between signing Fred Van Bleet and Dylan Brooks is it moves KPJ off the ball and probably specifically to the bench because it's not like you're just going to plug him in at one of the wings and say that that's his role, that he's just going to be straight up catch and shoot. So how do you feel like uh, kind of revisiting the same question that we did in the last episode now that Dylan Brooks is – uh, reportedly going to sign with the Rockets. What, what do you see the 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 net impact being on KPJ after both of these moves? Is he is he the point guard of the second unit? Is that Amon Thompson and he's moving off and he's playing more off the ball? How do you see that playing out with KPJ if I he's on the team? Only, still? I, I think it's only going to help him. I, I really do. I really think if he embraces the role, then he's got a chance to be an elite bench guy. Just running the second unit. He could be elite at that and he could coexist on the wing if you need him in crunch time. You know, I could, he could easily share the floor with Van Vliet and green. If that's how they want to do it, he can, he can lead the second unit. I think that for him, the possibilities really are endless. And I don't know how much Amin Thompson is going to play in year one. And I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I think that he now has the, you know, kind of the benefit of getting to sit back a little bit and, adjust to NBA life, which as we, and I'm sure the players that are already on the roster will tell him it's not that easy. Like it's not that easy to just come in right away and contribute right away to a team. And uh, you look at the Rockets have, have just uh, handed starters minutes to two top five picks the last two years. And it was not great, especially early on Jalen green really struggled that first half of his rookie season. Jabari Smith jr. Really struggled that first half of his rookie season. Uh, they both improved significantly as that season went along, but there were some serious growing pains and it's tough on the team because these are guys who, who basically are having to play. It's hurting the team in the process. So the team is losing games. So it, now you have it to where you don't really need a men Thompson to play right away. So that's good for the team because it, it rarely does a top five pick come in, especially a, a top five pick who is coming in from a, a lower level league, like overtime elite and like, to think that he would come in and be able to play at a replacement level from day one, it, it's it's difficult to see that. So you take a lot of the pressure off of him. He can come in in spurts. Um, he can basically be depth right now, understanding that he's a huge part of your future. So I, I think for Kevin Porter Jr., this only works out for him. Uh, for Amen Thompson, I think that this just takes a lot of the pressure off of him and he can just kind of sit back and learn. And one thing on Porter – um, cause this is not something that we've really talked about because I was just looking at it today. Um, there, he, this is a big season for him because of the way that his contract is structured. Now, the next season for him is guaranteed. That is the only year. It was what a four year, $64 million contract, whatever it was. That is the only year. The first year is the only one that's guaranteed. 
So he's got three years that right now are unguaranteed. Now, because he was on the roster June 30th or whatever the date was, or July, it was July 1st. That was the date where it triggered. He is now guaranteed $1 million for the final three years of that deal. If he's on the roster opening day, that number goes up to three. It goes up to six. If he's on the um, five days after the trade deadline. Now the big day for him is June 30th, 2024, because not only does his salary for the 2024, 25 season become guaranteed, but the salary for the next season becomes guaranteed that day as well. So he needs to, so this is a big year for him because not only does he does he have to try and guarantee himself that contract for 24 25 but also 25 26 and then the next year that's when 26 27 uh kicks in so there's a there's a lot of motivation for him to make this work because just of what he has to lose man that that's interesting so it's it's like you know you and I were having a conversation the other day of how is Kevin Porter Jr. going to respond to this? What's going to be the impact on him? Just sort of like, what's his response going to be? And when you lay out the contract like that, it kind of tells you that he, the only way that he can respond is motivated. And I wouldn't say deferential, but more so like willing and ready to do whatever the team asks him to do. You know, like he can't be, you know, sour about it and can't have an attitude. I'm not saying that he would. I have no idea how he feels about anything. I'm just saying that however he feels, the attitude and approach approach that he needs to take needs to be one of doing whatever is best for the team, as cliche as that sounds. But you got to come in now. Now that the team has made all of these win-now moves, quote-unquote, you have to come in and be ready to do whatever it is, whatever it takes to help the team win. And so if that means leading the second unit, what, whatever the hell that means, that's what you got to be willing to do if you want for that precious date, what was it again? June 30th, 2024? June 30th, yeah, June 30th, 2024. That's when the salary for the 2024-25 season and 2025-2026 season become guaranteed. Yeah. Or they can just waive them and that's it. And he doesn't get, not only does he not get the money for, he, he would only get $6 million, um for the 2024 2025 season and then he gets nothing for 25 26 nothing for 26 27 so yeah. like there uh, listen I, like i said and, and i've said this I've, I've kind of been i've said this really now for a while i think this only helps him moving forward i think this is going to make him such a better player moving forward a taking some of the pressure off b getting him on the floor against second units and then getting the ball out of his hands sometimes in crunch time to where probably his greatest strength has been as a catch and shoot guy. Now he can actually do that. Now they actually have somebody who is worthy of having the ball in his hands and creating shots for him. So I think, and I don't know how he's going to handle it. You know, we have not, shoot, we haven't talked to him since uh, the end of last season. And Cody Davis kind of brought up to him about playing off the ball. And he wasn't exactly pumped about the idea. Uh, I would be curious to know, um, because he's been, you know, he's been around, you know, he was with, he was at the Udoka press conference, uh, when he was introduced, um, he was with them in Chicago during the combine. So I imagine that they've kind of kept him up to date about what they were looking to do this off season. So I would imagine that he was prepared for, for the move that they were going to make and understanding that they were going to go after a point guard. Um, but hopefully that they've been able to kind of convey to him that this is only upside for him. This is only going to help him moving forward. Now it's just a matter of a, if he's going to listen and B, is he going to take this the right way? I, I, I would hope that he does. He's really, you know, for, for all the negative attention that he's gotten so much of it has been unwarranted. Like he really has been, I mean, he's been there. He was their best player last year. He was their best yeah. player. He was their most, most consistent player last year. Um, there's no reason to think that he won't take this the right way. And he, there's no reason to think that he won't, um, fi- you know, get that understanding that this is only going to help him, but you don't know until you see it. And we won't know until we actually get to talk to the guy and who knows when that's going to be. Yeah. I- I'll speak for myself. Just say personally, I'm just as excited and intrigued about the rocket second unit as I am the starting five that you projected that you put out there earlier. So we're thinking Fred Van Bleet. Jalen Green, Dylan Brooks, Jabari Smith, and Alperin Shingoon. And I think a lot of how good the Rockets are, like we know 
I feel like we have a pretty good sense of what to expect from Fred Van Bleet and Dylan Brooks. We know what their player profile is. We know what those guys are. And so that's why we're able to so confidently say that adding them, inserting them into your starting lineup makes it a better team, makes it a better starting lineup. What the, the difference is, is what step do those other three take, those young guys, which we obviously uh, you know do not know yet. We, do, we have no idea what the progression is going to be from year two to year three and from year one to year two for Jabari Smith specifically. But between the three of them, and being Green, Smith, and Shingun, I mean, those those are the guys that you're hoping take, you know, as as much of a leap as they possibly can, and and we'll see. But for me, you mentioned K- KPJ. We're talking about KPJ and him possibly leading the second unit, and then when you add that with the rookies that they drafted, and we talked about that, we don't know how much that those guys are going to play, but they're on the team, they're on the bench, and I'm hoping that they at least play some. You know, I'd, I'd love to see him get some run. Uh, you know, Cam Whitmore and Amon Thompson, we'll see what their roles are going to be. But you got KPJ going from being your best player on your team, leading your first unit to being just the best player on your bench and leading your bench. That is significant to me. Even if you're underwhelmed, like I am a little bit underwhelmed by the starting lineup, the depth of it to me is, is a pretty good upgrade. And with that, we can... We can look here at the signing of Jock Landell and Jeff Green. One big thing here is just overall, and specifically I'm talking about Van Vliet, Dylan Brooks, and then Jeff Green here. And, and of course, Landell's played a couple of years, but let's just stick with those three. What I really love is the veteran presence that they brought, sort of the adult in a room aspect of it. And I, I feel like these kids are growing up. You know, we talk about them as being kids, but the younger players, they are growing up. But there's just no substitute for experience, and these guys got a lot of it. Talking about Jeff Green, obviously just playing on the championship team. Uh, D- Dylan Brooks at least playing on a competitive Memphis team over the last few years. And obviously Fred Van Vliet being a, a former champion from a few years ago. Jacques Landell is somebody who has played at least some significant basketball being on the Suns last year. As a matter of fact, he became he ended up becoming – the more reliable big at times for the Suns down the stretch there, which was a, a sight to see. I wouldn't say more reliable, but, but maybe maybe it seemed that at times they trusted Jock Landale more than they did uh, DeAndre Aiden, not to say that he's anywhere near as talented. But th- that is what stands out to me at least about the group of guys that they got is that they added some veteran presence, some guys that have played some winning basketball, and on these two particular signings, Jeff Green, we know very well, familiar with his movies. With Jock Landell, clearly their backup center, signs a four-year, $32 million deal. But that doesn't seem like somebody that's going to challenge Alper Shingun for the starting center job like maybe Brooke Lopez would have. So I'm curious of what your thoughts on these two signings were or what your thoughts are on these two signings. Obviously, we've talked already about Dylan Brooks and Fred Van Vliet. What are your thoughts on Landale and Jeff Green? Um, Landale is obviously, I guess, the, the guy that people aren't as familiar with, even though he got the bigger contract here. But Landale's good, and, and you know he he's been in winning programs for a long time. You know he, he went to St. Mary's, and so um, they won a lot of games in St. Mary's. He's a little bit older; he's twenty seven. Uh, hasn't been in the NBA for very long, but. Um, you know, San Antonio, Phoenix, uh, last year, Phoenix, uh, this season. And like you said, he became, you know, he was playing a lot, you know, during the postseason uh, for the Suns. It was, it was an important part of what they were doing. Um, you know, I'll, we'll have to wait and see um, exactly how the big man mix works. I would think that Shingun's going to start and that he'd come off the bench, but who knows in certain units, who knows how guys play off one another. So that's kind of a to be determined thing. Um, the contract again, the the top line number, it, it looks big. It's you know f- uh, four years, thirty two, but only the first year is guaranteed. So again, you you know, don't make too big a deal out of the top line. Wait and see, you know, how everything else shakes out. And the reason why that's important is that that becomes a very tradable contract. And if you want, if there's a, a an eight million dollar player, or whatever, or you need to try and stack up salary. That's another reason why you make some of these signings. It's because you know, you don't want your team to just be all max guys and all minimum guys, because then it's really hard to improve your team through trades. Uh, so you need sort of those middle-class guys. 
and with what they did with both Brooks and with Landell, and then you add Porter into that mix and even Jay Sean Tate's contract, you have some of those middle class guys that make it so that you can stack some contracts. And, you know, well, we just talked about Porter. He's not guaranteed really uh, after this season. Landale's not guaranteed after this season. So guys like that, you know, you can put those contracts in a trade and whoever you're trading them to, if you if that's the route that you want to go, you know, the teams aren't necessarily going to be on the hook for the remainder of those contracts. So that's why it makes sense to structure those deals the way that they did. And even, you know, $8 million for Jock Landale in two years, it's not going to be that bad. You know, the way that the cap keeps going up, you know, um, the cap could wind up being $25 million higher in two years than it is right now. So an $8 million contract today is going to look a whole lot different than $8 million in two years. So uh, Landale's a professional. He knows how to play. He knows where to be. And again, those were little things that they just weren't good at. And he's also got good size. You know, he's, he's a seven footer, he's six eleven, seven seven feet. And the, you know, they were bringing Usman Garuba, who we'll talk about in a minute off the bench and Garuba's an undersized center. So at least now you have somebody who physically can handle that. And Landell did okay, I guess, when having to defend Nikola Jokic uh, during the, the Western Conference semis. Um, as good as you can hope for somebody to do against Nikola Jokic. But again, it, it gives them options. And that's what you're looking for. You are looking for options. You are looking for guys who don't have like huge holes in their game. Because I think with the guys, a bunch of the guys that we're going to talk about in a minute, of the guys that they let go, those guys had huge holes and those, yeah. those guys had holes that you could really attack. And I think somebody like Landale, I don't think he has that. Uh, I don't expect a ton out of Jeff Green. I think that I don't, I don't think he's a, the type of guy who's going to get a ton of minutes, but he's a guy to have. And he, he know, and you can, if you need him to play, he can come in and he can do, he can do things and he can help you. And um, you don't have to spend a bunch of time trying to teach him stuff. Cause he's seen everything that you can see in this league. So just having, you know, kind of that institutional memory of understanding what to do when you're, when you're on the floor, that's the sort of stuff that's important. And that's the sort of stuff that they have been really lacking the last couple of years. Yeah. I, I think that's really well said on, on Jeff green as a guy who it, it's, it's not like a few years ago or, or, you know, when he was here the last time. And even then he was kind of somebody that you could just kind of plug and play and just somebody who knew how to play. But like for, for me, it's it's like with Jeff Green, the, exactly what you said. Anytime you, you can forget that he's on the team, but you throw him out there and he's just played a lot of basketball. God knows what he's doing. And there's some value in that. You know, it, this may be an overused phrase now on this podcast, but I'll use it again here in this specific case because he's a guy that may or may not play like we don't know how much Jeff Green's going to play or how much they're going to need him to play or not but when we talk about overall basketball intelligence well there it is you brought some you brought some whether he plays or not he's on the team and he'll be a guy that I think guys can rely on younger guys can especially can rely on and with Landell you know both of us have have spoken on what he brings here but but here here's my thing the sort of somewhat concern or I would say question that I have about this free agency period here over these last few days before we get to these young guys that they that they traded away, and you mentioned Garuba. But before we get to those guys, this is, would be my question. Did they significantly, or how significantly did they improve their shooting and their, and their defense? How, how significantly did they overall improve their shooting and defense, specifically three-point shooting and specifically rim protection. Because I think we can acknowledge that Fred Van Vliet is somebody that helps their shooting a little bit and, and probably helps their overall shooting just because of his ability to run an offense. So you have to keep that in mind. Dylan Brooks obviously helps their perimeter defense, you know, as one of the better perimeter wings that you would be able to find in the NBA. But overall... And this might not necessarily be a fault of the Rockets' own. Like this is the, just the market that 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 was out there. They got the best players that I that they probably feel like they could get. But overall, how much better of a three point shooting team is this? And how much better are they at say protecting the rim with Alperen Shingun being there? Probably going to play most of the minutes, I would imagine at center. We'll see how that goes. And then of course Jock Landale. Like those are the things that I'm not really sure of when I'm thinking of wanting to get. 
you know, come away with Brooke Lopez and Fred Van Bleet and Dylan, you know, come come away with every your entire wish list. You didn't get that. And so now I'm questioning that. Like how how much of an improvement are, are, are do you have in those two areas? Um rim protection, they didn't improve it at all. I mean, let's yeah. just be honest. They they did not improve their rim protection. Um, but the hope is that the the improvements that they made along the perimeter will at least help the rim protection a little bit to where maybe, hey, there's not j- just this red carpet to the rim anymore. And if there's just a red carpet to the rim, then you have to have rim protection. But at least if there is, you know, a, a little bit of resistance along the perimeter, the rim protection issue doesn't, you know, it, it's not nearly um, as, as much of a, it just as much of a sore throat. It doesn't stick out quite as much uh, when you actually have some resistance along the perimeter. So yeah, I'm with you. The the rim protection, it, it has not gotten better. Um Obviously, had they been able to get Brooke Lopez, it would have improved significantly. But, you know, the Lopez fit, we talked about this going into free agency. It might have been a little weird because you would have been given giving Lopez big minutes. And how does that how does that work with Shingu? Um, I think that at least now you have two centers and I don't think that you need to give any either of them so many minutes to where you might have to play them together. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. I think on the rim protection stuff. You kind of have to hope that somebody like Jabari Smith Jr. becomes a little bit more of a rim protector uh, than he has been in the past. I don't know if that's necessarily his best role as a de- as a defender in this league, but I do think that he can do it a little bit. But uh, and I think the other thing that's important, and and I talk about just like having the red carpet to the rim, um, but also having veterans who know how to play within a defensive scheme. That's important too, um, because I think the one issue that they have had defensively. Both um, their transition defense has been awful because they turn the ball over a million times, but they've also had guys who just simply don't know how to play within a scheme. And, you know, they might overhelp or they might make some, there, there was always some sort of a defensive breakdown. And I think the hope now that you add some actual vets who know what they're doing, you don't have those same type of breakdowns. Um, the shooting, um, I, I do think that it's probably gotten better, probably not as much as people would have hoped, but I think that Brooks is probably a better three-point shooter or can be a better three-point shooter than K.J. Martin. Um, I think he's probably a better – let me look up the numbers just on Tari Eason right now with where he finished out um, as a three-point shooter last year. He was at 34%. Um, you know, it's it's a little bit – so it, it, there's some similarities there, but Van Vliet is better um than what they had i think and and then i think that their three-point shooting gets better because um you have some catch and shoot opportunities now or you have more catch and shoot opportunities um for kevin porter jr and so you know that was an area where he really thrived was catch and shoot now he may have an opportunity to do that a little bit more so i think that that in turn will help their shooting but you know, I, I think that a lot of people were hoping that, hey, they would get that wing who's just a, a cold-blooded three-point shooter, 38 40%, you know, whether it would have been a Cam Johnson or somebody along those lines. That's not going to happen. But I do think that they have I, – I think the ceiling is probably a little bit higher on their three-point shooting than maybe it feels like right now. Fair enough. So let's move on to these younger players that they ended up moving on from – the biggest name of them all is probably KJ. I'm not going to say probably. The biggest name of them all is KJ He's Mark. The He's the yeah. The, the let, let me reframe it. The best player that was traded was KJ Martin. The other three were first round picks. Is that is that is that accurate? Is that right? Add yeah. late first round picks to that sentence. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. That, that's, that's the that's the big yeah. kind of divider. Well, that they well, late first round picks. I was going to get to that before I got to that. I just. I put it that way because KJ was a second round pick in and of himself. So like KJ Martin, the best player of them all, the rest, because I mean, the, the same is true about second round picks, right? And even more so it's the hit rate, the likelihood of them being what KJ Martin turned out to be. So you got KJ Martin, Usman Garuba, Josh Christopher, and Ty Ty Washington. Uh, the, the 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 first round picks that we mentioned Garuba Christopher and Washington obviously first round late first round picks of the last two years or the last two seasons and then KJ Martin a second round pick I guess now three years ago this is going into year four for him right yes uh, so so these are young players um 
I, I think that what's funny and what stands out to me whenever I watch the reaction is how emotionally attached that fans get to players, even when they're on teams that are going nowhere. Like, even when they're on teams that are headed absolutely nowhere. And these players, quite honestly, are not guys that you should really have that much of an emotional attachment to, at least not to them being on your team. If you want to root for them, that's fine, obviously, whatever. But Ty Ty Washington, Usman Garuba, Josh Christopher, even K.J. Martin to an extent, those guys being on your team is not like, you know, make or break sadness type of stuff. But K.J. Martin, a useful player, we've talked about that a lot on this podcast. Uh, we did the redraft several months ago of where he would go, and he'd probably be a lottery pick in his draft. Um, but th- let me get your reaction, man, to, to first of all, to all of these guys being, being shipped away. I think we knew, my whole thing is, I think we knew that there were certain players that were going to have to go and be replaced, that they were going to have to make room on this roster for players that could help them win, and certain players that simply do not help them win were going to have to go, either be traded or waived or whatever it was. We saw with Dacia Nix, they just let him go, and then these other guys, they they traded. What did you what did you think of these moves? Um, the Martin one I was surprised with just because they didn't get very much. You know, They only got a second-round pick, and – you know, that was one of the things that I talked about with, with somebody in their front office before the trade deadline is that they weren't going to just trade him to trade him. And if, you know, people thought that they could get him for just a second round pick, they weren't going to hang, they were, they were just going to hang up the phone on that. So the fact that they just moved him for just two second rounders, that to me was surprising, but I guess there just wasn't a market. I, I feel like there probably would have been a market for him um, once the season started. But I also, at the same time, you look at who they've added there probably just weren't going to be a whole lot of minutes there. And once you add Brooks, when you already have Eason and Smith, who are probably bigger priority guys at this point, there just weren't going to be minutes for KJ Martin. So, you know, you kind of have to move on from him at that point. Uh, so that that move surprised me. But at the same time, when you kind of look at the, at the outlay of the team, it made sense. And it's hard for me to think that his value would have increased once the season started, especially when you consider where he seemed to be just on the totem pole. Um, Ty Ty Washington surprised me a little bit that they just kind of cut the cord after one year, but we, we talked about this a lot during the season. He had significant holes in his game and it's pretty clear. They didn't think that those holes were going to get fixed or could be fixed or that they're just simply were going to be minutes for him. So, um, you know, they, they moved on it and it, it, it kind of shows you, um, man, those late first round picks really aren't worth very much. And, um, they're, they're, they're worth a lot in theory. People love having them, but at the end of the day, when you pick 29th, it's not a great pick. Um, and, and so I think that's what you kind of see, uh, with Ty Ty Washington, where you just, you know, it's just, you're, you're not going to get a lot unless you get lucky. You're not going to get much, um, out, out of that pick. Um, and then the other two, uh, the other two were not a surprise at all. Um, yeah. Usman Garuba uh, just didn't do enough. And, you know, he didn't have much of an opportunity as a rookie. Part of that was just the injuries. And he did some things well this past season when he did finally get a chance. But at the same time, undersized center, um, he could switch, but he just wasn't going to necessarily be able to hold up defensively against bigger guys. And then offensively, he was just a huge minus. You know, he started to make some threes, but it was not like a shot that you really had faith that was going in. If it, he was wide open, I mean, he was wide open every time he took that shot. And when it went in, it was a surprise. Like it never looked great whenever he took it. So I don't think anybody thought that he would be like a high volume three point shooter who would shoot him at a high percentage. You know, it, it always seemed a little bit fluky. So that one wasn't a surprise. I just, you know. Mm-hmm. Adam, we were patronizing whenever he would hit the threes. We were like, look at him, look at him hit the threes. I mean, from the form, from the fact that he was wide open. I mean, we were we were having fun with it in a season where there wasn't a lot of fun to be had because they were struggling so much. It was like Usman Garuba. I mean, you remember that stretch where he hit like his first. It was like seven of eight at one point. Yeah. I mean, we were. We I, were I, think I, I even joked as high as like uh, understanding that, you know, you know, whatever, 84 percent is probably not sustainable. But, you know, it, that was just it, it was one of those things that 
he he worked hard to you know get to the point to where he could make that shot but nobody respect nobody was worried about him shooting that shot if you're if you're an opposing team and again just didn't have the size and he was you know he was bad the second half like he showed you some things in the first half and then once you got to the second half he was almost unplayable for a lot of it so again it wasn't a surprise and then the same thing with Josh Christopher and I, I think Josh Christopher is one of the guys at least you know from an online standpoint where the fans really fell in love with him uh, and he did do some things his rookie year and he, but the fact that, and I remember I wrote about this or I don't know if I wrote about it, but I mentioned it just during the first preseason game. He was like the 13th guy to come off the bench in that first preseason game against San Antonio, or, you know, he was the eighth guy or whatever to come off them. He was the the 13th player who checked into that first preseason game. And that's when you kind of realize eh, and just not a lot there. And, yeah. and I know that there were some highlight plays as a rookie, but you remember watching him in summer league where he kind of ran the offense and it just wasn't very good. And so all the holes that he had in his game, he just did not improve on the, on any of those, you know, he's, he's kind of the size of a point guard, but he couldn't play point guard. So you could basically only play him at the two and he couldn't shoot. Like the shooting got worse over the course of the season. And you know, you look at just what he did in, in his second year, you know, he, he only played in 22 of their first 40 games. Okay. So he didn't get much of an opportunity. Uh, you know, he went down to the G league a couple times, but he played in their final 42 games of the year. And it's not like he was playing eight minutes. He was playing 15 minutes a game, which again, you know, that's a, that's a good number of minutes. And, you know, we're looking at seven points on six and a half shots. You know, 25% from three, he didn't get to the line. He wasn't really much of a playmaker. And then defensively, he would get lost too often. And so I, I think that he he was a disappointment. And so it was hard to think that he was going to get much better uh, from that point on. So, you know, he, if he can, you know, clean up the shooting, clean up the ball handling, become a better decision maker, then yeah, he, he has an opportunity to stick in the league. But they're just there were no minutes for that on this team now. You know, they they aren't at the point to where they can, you know, they could have kept him, but he wasn't going to play. So at least he gets an opportunity to maybe get some minutes in in Memphis or wherever he winds up when all these when all these moves are are finally finalized. Uh but it just wasn't going to happen here. So um the Washington one was a little bit surprising because, you know, they kind of jettison after one year. Um the KJ one was was surprising just because the return wasn't real real strong, but Garuba and Christopher, I think we both kind of expected that it was unlikely that they would be on the team at least once training camp broke. Um, so, you know, it's just, that's business and, you know, never get too attached to the low first round picks because at the end of the day, um, they're probably not going to be very good NBA players. That's just what history tells you. Yeah. I think you put it well with Garuba and Washington, uh, or I'm sorry, Garuba and Christopher, not being guys that can really give you a lot of minutes on a winning team. You know, I, I I think it was fine to see what they had. Like the drafting them in and of itself wasn't like in and of itself wasn't a failure. Those guys just did not turn out to work out, you know, and kind of going back to the point of what you're getting once you're picking that late in the first round. Uh, so Gar- Garuba just not quite good enough. Christopher, interestingly to me, just a tweener who wasn't good enough at either one thing. You know, like you mentioned, the size of a point guard, but not really a playmaker. The game of a two guard, but just not that dynamic of a score, not that dynamic enough of a score to be an undersized two guard. So he's just kind of just stuck in between there, un- unsure really of what to expect of him or what where to put him, how, how to how to slide like you got to put him in there with a point guard. And so both guys are undersized. And then, like you mentioned, he's not really playing, giving you like plus super high level defense. So it's just one of those tweeners that's not quite dynamic enough to be a tweener. If you're going to be a tweener, you got to be like dynamic at something, you know, either it's your shooting or your passing or your defense or something's got to pop. And with Josh Christopher, it was just like, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, he's, he can clearly can play basketball, but not just, not at a high enough level, it felt like. The K.J. Martin thing, to me, is interesting just because, like, so I've, I've given my points on Dylan Brooks. <laughs> I got this little conflict of I would rather watch K.J. Martin play basketball. 
I I am a bigger fan of KJ Martin, the basketball player, the athleticism, his hustle. I thought he gave you everything he had. Um, and, and and at times, at least last year, I think he improved. We talked uh, again about basketball intelligence. I think he's improved over time as well. And so I really liked and was a fan of his game, a, a fan of watching him play basketball. And even with that, I got to concede that Dylan Brooks overall offers you more just because the defense is elite. You know, with, with KJ, the only thing that you'd probably say was elite about his game is the athleticism. Mm-hmm. A- everything else was just really good, solid, you know, or co- or or coming together. Not Maybe not everything, but a lot of it was starting to come together and was kind of solid. There was not an elite thing that KJ really did other than the athleticism. Dylan Brooks brings you elite defense, and I'm conflicted in that because I'd much rather see KJ play. I'd much rather see his game. And I think I think Tari Eason's got some potential to be Dylan Brooks light, you know, um, but obviously he's just going into his second season. So they have players there that, and KJ's one of them, that I felt like I was more comfortable with or I should say – wanted to watch more in that spot than Dylan Brooks, even if I got to concede that Dylan Brooks is the better player. So uh, I'm surprised, too, given that, you know, they didn't have to trade KJ. They didn't have – it's not like they were against the the gun or against the clock. I know you mentioned that there may, there may not have been a, uh, a lot of minutes for him, but I, I don't see why not, given that he could play so many positions. There should have been – I feel like there should have been some minutes for him between the three, four, and five, and he can play any of them. That that's somebody that they could have fit in there, but maybe they're just ready to move on, you know. Um, and and that's that you know that, that's that. But the the return is a little bit surprising, given that we both think that he's the quality of a lottery pick in his own draft. Um, I don't, I don't think, I think the the idea of him playing center, I don't think that was there. You know, he's it's only six six and. I think it's hard to play center at six, six, you know, I think that organizationally they have kind of given that a try. So I don't think that was really much of a possibility. And are you playing him over Shingun? Are you playing him over Landell? Probably not. So then you look, are you giving um, KJ Martin minutes over Tari Eason? Probably not. Are you giving him minutes over Jamari Smith? Probably not. So that's why I can just kind of say that the minutes, especially when you add Brooks to the mix, and we've talked about possibly Porter playing playing uh, along the wing now, uh, and then you add Whitmore. Who knows what's going to happen with him? So it just didn't. So just you have that minutes crunch, and you know you can only play you know two hundred. You only have two hundred and forty minutes a game to divide out between your guys, and you know at some point you run short. You know you can't play everybody twenty minutes a game. So I just don't think that there were going. So I just don't think the minutes would have been there which would have led to him being unhappy, especially in a contract year. Uh, and then his value would have gone down. And I think it just would have put a cloud over everything. So while you don't get the value that I think that you should have gotten for him, it's understandable why they just went ahead and got that deal done. Now uh, it's one of those things that just might benefit them a little bit more in the long run, both with the players, both with players around the league and also with the agent. I mean, you, you can't kind of underestimate how much, that sort of stuff matters by keeping an agent happy because that might, you know, help you get another player in, in the future. So um, sometimes you have to take a little bit less just because of what it might mean moving forward. So you and I have talked about how these young players need to start playing meaningful basketball, yes. meaningful minutes, meaningful games. So the question I have to you, I'm still sorting it out in my head, but the question I have to you is, how meaningful of games will this team be playing? Is this a play-in tournament team? I know we agree that they have improved, that they have gotten themselves better, but how much better? How much better can we, without without having seen it, without really knowing how it's all going to come together, without knowing if they're done, you know, and, and what, what else they might do throughout this offseason, just as currently constructed as you and I sit here now, what do we think about this team and how it, stacks up against his competitors in the West. So they're better. I don't think there's any question about that. How much better? I, I don't know. I, I really, I've been thinking about that because while I sit here and tell you that they're better, I can look at basically everybody in the West and say something similar. Um, 
and that's, you know, when we talk about the play-in and can they get into the play-in mix, that means that they're having to jump over some of these teams. So I'm just going to go through the standings in the West, just going backwards. And you tell me, do you feel like they are better than any of these teams? San Antonio, are they better than San Antonio? They might be just because it's not like, obviously the Spurs added Wimbenyama. Did I say it right this time? I don't know. So they, they added I, I, I think it was close enough. I okay. think it was close. We'll, we'll, we'll give you the thumbs up. They added the top pick in the draft, but they really haven't added anybody else outside of him. And that roster wasn't very good last year. So I'm going to go ahead and say that right now they are better than the Spurs. Okay. So that's one. So, you know, they, yeah. they need to, they need to get it to 10th. They've, 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 they've taken out one team. Portland looks like they're going to trade Damian Lillard. So you can probably sit here and say, yeah, you know what? The Rockets are better than the Blazers. Okay. That gets them to 13th. All right. Utah. That's where it gets tricky. Yeah. And the answer is that's no, they are not better than Utah. Yeah. Uh, Dallas. Are they nope. better than Dallas? No. Nope. No. Are they better than New Orleans? No. Are they better than Oklahoma City? I don't think so. Are they better than Minnesota? I don't believe in Minnesota, but no. Are no. they better than Lakers? Absolutely not. Golden State. Yeah, once once we go from you know start talking about the Warriors, Clippers, Suns, Kings, Grizzlies, Kings, Grizzlies. Nuggets, yeah, no. The the answer is no. So right now, right now, it, at least it doesn't feel like it's some, something. And this is what I was getting at earlier, Adam, about Jalen Green and Shingoon and these younger guys. Like, you know, and I'm I'm not banking on it that these guys are all of a sudden just going to be all NBA guys next year or anything like that. But as currently constructed, as we know this team, the way we know it right now, the answer is no. Those yeah. guys, th this team is not better than all those teams that you just mentioned, other than maybe and the Spurs are maybe. You know, the Spurs are are maybe depending on how things look. And I feel comfortable about the saying that they're better than the Blazers just based off of them getting rid of Lillard. But hell, if Scoot Henderson comes in there all of a sudden and, you know, like who knows him and Jeremy Grant, like I, I have no idea how that's going to look. But those are the only two that I could even make a case for them being better than right now. Yeah. So that that's the thing. So when we talk about them being better, I think that we would both agree that, yes, they are better. But does that get them into the play and mix? The answer is probably not. And so then the question becomes, well, organizationally, can they live with that? And I uh, hope oh, that's that's kind of a to be determined thing. So I'm I'm really curious to, to hear them once we get into September and October. Is that like kind of the be all end all to where they have to be in the play in? Because I think that that's asking an awful lot of this group to go from 22 wins to now, you know, the the 10th, 10th place. What was it 42? So are, are they going to jump up by 20 wings next year? It's hard to, it's hard to see it. You know, it's not like they added, it's not like it's Cleveland and they added LeBron James. No, this is, they added, you know, some pieces, but I don't know if those pieces are worth 20 wings. So uh, I, I think so much of it, you know, I, I think they've cleaned up the roster. I think that they have risen the floor of the roster, but in order for them to hit some sort of a ceiling, the guy, the, the guys who have been here, the Greens, the Porters, the Smiths, the Shingoons, the Easons, those are the guys that are going to move this team from, you know, they can be in 13th place to getting into that 10th place to getting into that 8th place. So those guys are ultimately the development of those guys. That's going to be the key to this whole thing. And the hope is that the floor has now been risen to where, you know, they might not win all these games, but they'll at least be able to compete in all these games because they will have – you know, they, they will, you know, like I said, you got to fill 240 minutes every night. They will fill those minutes with guys who are actually NBA caliber players. Yeah. And, and to their credit, to Rockets leadership's credit, I think it was M.A. Udoka who made this point. And maybe Rafa Stone did as well. But I remember M.A. Udoka mentioning a couple of times that they wanted to bring in guys that would complement and supplement. I don't know if that's those are the exact quotes or the exact words, but basically bringing in guys that would complement what they already had going on. They weren't necessarily looking for, you know, a, a new face of the franchise type of thing. They were they were looking for veterans who had played winning basketball and could come and help them establish a culture. And I think that they at the very least did get that. How much better is it going to make them in relation and comparison to their competitors to you know to the rest of the west we're gonna have to see it and i think you and i have both said a different version of it lies in 
the young core. Like the the growth and the progression and the maturation of this team is all relying upon how these young players develop, how quickly they develop, and exactly what that looks like. Is Jalen Green the potential all NBA player that people think he is? Like, could that happen in year three? Is that something that you're still waiting for by year four, year five? Like, we'll just have to see how long it takes, but that's what it's all about. It's not it's not like this is a fixer or, you know, an eraser for all of the things that they were lacking. Like, it, it addresses a lot of needs, but, and like you said, it raises the the floor at the very least, but you don't just sign Fred Van Bleet and Dylan Brooks and say, okay, now we're ready to go, boys. It's like, no, you sign those guys and then you look around and you say, okay, hey, we've we've added some leadership and some particular skills as your supporting cast with these guys, and we need y'all to take that step. Y'all being, like we mentioned, Jalen Green, Jabari Smith, Alpern Shingoon, Tari East, and Kevin Porter Jr.'s role as a either a six-man or whatever it is that they're going to do with him. That That's one of the more fascinating sidebars to me. I think the main thing, obviously, is the young players, how they develop that sort of that young core that we talked about, the draft picks, how they sort of mesh in with these veterans that they just brought in. But the sidebar to me is also Kevin Porter Jr. Because I agree with the point that you made. This is an opportunity for him to really make good on his contract. I think like to, to, to first of all, get those last couple of years guaranteed, but to also be utilized in a way that better suits him, you know, to, to be utilized in a way that better suits and complements exactly what he could do. And they, they signed all these guys with the hope that they would supplement the roster, not take it over. Yeah, okay. supplement. So, that's the, that. That's the word I was trying to go for that I was whiffing on. Supplement. There you go, Adam. They, they don't want these guys to be the stars. And, and I get that they're paying Van Vliet to essentially be the star, but I don't think that ultimately that's what they want his role to be. They want them to help the younger guys. Ultimately, they want the guy who they picked second in the draft two years ago to take the reins. They want the guy who they drafted third uh, overall last year to take the reins. They want the guy who did, who they just drafted fourth overall uh, a couple of weeks ago to take the reins. That's that's who they want the foundation of the team to be. But Van Vliet and Brooks and Landell, those are the guys who are going to help. They want to have help round out the rest of the roster, at least for the next couple of years. Yeah, and, and if they – if they can help those guys play in more competitive games and play in more meaningful basketball games, that I think you can argue. Like if they can help make a Jalen Green, help you make the decision on if he's a max player, help make you uh, sure, uh, more sure of some of these other players, I, I feel like that's worth it as well. Like if they're elevating the players that you do expect to be the players that others would want to pay, like – you know, people look at Fred Van Vliet and say, well, that's not a uh, $130 million player. Well, they hope that Jalen Green is, right? And if Fred Van Vliet can come in there and help him be that, help ensure that he becomes that, that's almost worth it, especially in a year when you, when you had the money to spend. That's another thing that we haven't hit on as we get out of here, Adam, that I feel like is somewhat misunderstood about this process. And maybe we've done a good enough job already hitting on it, but I want to reiterate. It's forest for the trees. It's not seeing the forest for the trees to be like Fred Van Vliet's not worth $43 million. No, man, they had the money to spend, and these were the guys who were available for it to be spent on, and they needed to get their team better. So it almost just doesn't really matter that Fred Van Vliet is not what you might consider a $43 million player, a $43 million a year player. It's just the fact that He's one of the best that you could get out there. He feels a need. He helps your team and you've got the money to spend. And so that's really all that it's about. It's not about like I saw a comment that was like, you pay guys max contract or superstar money to be a superstar. Not necessarily in the NBA, you know, not necessarily like maybe, maybe ideally, but not necessarily. And I think this was a not ideal, but necessary scenario for them. Oh, that's what free agency is like free agency is usually just one big overpay. You know, if you want impact players in free agency, you're not going bargain hunting. That's not how this works, especially when they are going to have other suitors. So um, are, is Fred Van Vliet an overpay at, at, you know, 
at 40 something million, whatever it is. It, it's uh three years, years, 130 with the last year being, you know, a, a team option. Like, is that an overpay? Yeah, it's an overpay, but that's what free agency is. And that's why they hoarded all this cap space was because they knew that they were just going to make a big splash and they weren't worried about the dollar amount. That's just how it is. And you, like you said, you ha- like you have to get to a salary floor. Like that's now in the CBA. It used to be in the CBA. You know, you could get to the salary floor by the trade deadline or by by a certain date. Now you have to be there on opening night. And so they had to get there. And, you know, it's it's not like they gave a 35-year-old $40 million for the next couple of years. He's 29. Like he's he is right within his prime and he filled a hole that they needed to fill. So it, it works for him. It works, I think, for, for both sides. We got summer league coming up. Odyssey's not sending us to summer league, unfortunately. We're gonna be doing the morning show filling in for Payne and Pendergast that week. But we will be locked in. We'll figure out how we want to handle this because I do feel like there is enough excitement and energy around the team now between the draft and free agency. And we're expecting a lot of these young players to play. And we want to get looks at them at Summer League. Again, kind of sucks we won't be there. We'd like to be there. But since we won't. Tell the we'll boss. Be- yeah. Well, I hope hopefully let this be a test to see how much they listen, to see how deep in the podcast the bosses actually get. Let's see if y'all hear our cry and our plea to at least get Adam to go to summer league. That guy deserves to go. Um, I can hold things down here, but damn it. One of us should go and it should be Adam. So hopefully Odyssey's listening. And, uh, we'll see. This is a, this is an interesting test case to see if they get into a, you know, an hour plus into the H town who's podcast, but I'm glad that y'all did make sure that you are rating, reviewing, telling people about the podcast, go ahead and give it the five stars that it deserves. And until next time, y'all be good.